Good morning. Um, my name is Liz Denny and I'm what's called an Access Service Officer. I work in the Public Record Office Victoria and let's just see if this works. Yes. So, um, I work in the Ballarat Archive Centre, which is a branch, I suppose, repository of the main archives of Public Record Office Victoria. Public Record Office Victoria is the State Archives of Victoria. They hold government records from the time of the Port Phillip District, the Colony of Victoria, the State of Victoria, which is over 170 years of government records now, and that's a lot of family history contained in those records. In those um, records, there are material and uh, records about families who have ancestors from China, because after all, people from China have been migrating and settling in Victoria since before the gold rush, in fact, and um, some of uh, records of them are preserved in the state archives and regional archives like Ballarat and the Bendigo Regional Archives Centre, which with the um, library in Bendigo holds historical records of Bendigo, but also state records of the Bendigo area. So I will probably skip um, between records from different centres in this talk because it is impossible to simply go to one archive, um, even in the state archives, to get material on your family. I'll also, like Diana, be running between different sources of information and um, we'll mention them, but I will focus on records from Ballarat, and I will also try and use records um, that you can find digitised initially, although you will eventually find yourself compelled to go to the archives and look at the real thing, and that's one of the excitements of archival research, holding a hundred-year-old document in your hand, a letter, a court record, um, even sometimes a photograph, though photographs are rare in the state archives, and realising that, that this is a, 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 a record made possibly even by the, period, by the person whom you're looking for. So I'm going to do, um, first of all, an introduction to where we are in the hope that at the end of this talk, all of you will eventually end up in Ballarat looking at the Ballarat Archives um, contents. So we're in what's called the glass box, this hideous um, square glass box of state government offices in the middle of beautiful Ballarat. We're quite near the railway station, five minutes walk. We are a free service. We, uh, just like everywhere in the state records, we offer help and access to the state records of Victoria. But we are only open two days a week, Monday and Tuesday, 9.30 to 4.30. Unlike our main archives in North Melbourne who are open five days a week, and some Saturdays. But all this information you can find on our website. We keep you well posted with maps, details and times. So in terms of what we hold at the Ballarat Archive Centre, we hold local records of the Ballarat region. So roughly, if you think of from Backers Marsh to Stall and from Dalesford to Teesdale, not quite as far as Geelong, is the catchment area for our records. And we deal with local records. So we have mining records, we have municipal records, the records of shires and town councils, and although that might sound boring, local council records are fantastic. There is a bill for underpants for the mayoress of Ballarat, and I bet she never knew they were going to end up in the Ballarat correspondence. So there's stuff in um, council correspondence which is very revealing and very interesting. It's not as boring as you might think. Um, in terms of local schools, for example, you would have to go to the main archives because land records, education records, criminal court records are generally in the main archives in Melbourne. So um, today I'm hoping to talk about some very interesting records, particular to Ballarat, mostly mining records, um, but also some records of what's called the Chinese Protectorate, administration of Chinese populations in Ballarat, and then a whole range of other records um, which are the sorts of records that you'd use for your family history for people who haven't come from China. So everything I talk about today, all these records, although I'm focusing on Chinese people on the Ballarat goldfields, the same records will give you the same interesting information about people from Britain, from Wales, from Cornwall, from Scotland, from Ireland, Scandinavian ancestors on the goldfields, German ancestors. There were a lot of Germanic people speaking German on the goldfields. So... 
In terms of the documents that I have to do with Chinese people in uh, Ballarat, in particular on the Ballarat goldfields, they consist of government documents in Chinese. Um, official documents such as regulations, um, notices to the population, and things like garden licenses in the 19th century bilingual. They were printed in both English and Chinese. Then we have government documents about Chinese people. Um, Chinese people turn up in the same range of 19th century records, court records, inquests, hospitals, rate records, mining records, as do people from Britain and other places. If you're interested and have not yet looked at the PROV website, I'd recommend you do. There's a lot of help, including online guides, to um, show you how to research specific records and also general help in family history research using government records of Victoria. And the other category of records that I'll be dealing with are very rare and very precious. These are the documents written by Chinese people on the gold fields in both English and Chinese. Now, um, the earlier talk on the Immigration Museum showed you the richness of personal records in English from English migrants. Unfortunately, we have very little in terms of personal experience of people from China on the gold fields. There is a little, and um, more and more is coming to light, and places like Heritage Victoria will have fantastic things like phrase books in Chinese. Um, so Chinese people from in coming to Ballarat would learn how to say, I saw a kangaroo in English, and there is a bushfire, and no, I won't lower the price of my vegetables. So have a look around. You will find lots of resources more and more coming to light and being digitised and being made public. Um, now I'm just going to do a slight diversion. Because there aren't many photographs in the archives, maps and written documents are our strength. There are a few, but not many. I'm going to cheat a little. This beautiful arch was erected by the Chinese community in Melbourne for Federation in 1901. But I'm putting it up because it's typical of what Goldfield Chinese communities, and there are lots of records in Ballarat newspapers in the 19th century, would put up for big civic events and parades. In fact, there's one from 1867 described in the Ballarat Star, but it sounds exactly like this, and it had puppets worked by hot air lanterns around the base, and it was hugely appreciated, and there was a whole paragraph given to it in the local paper. So the Chinese people were very good at putting on exciting displays and parades in local towns, and the population of those towns really appreciated it and went out of their way to invite the community to join in things like visits from governors, Easter fairs, and the other thing was that the Chinese community also um, had a very strong sense of civic responsibility and very frequently um, put in funds to things like orphanages, local hospitals, and for instance, the Ballarat Benevolent Asylum. So I'm now pinching a digitized image from the State Library site. This is 1875. Um, this is a parade in Ballarat. And uh, this has come from one of the Ballarat Joss houses. And everyone is dressed up. They're fundraising for the Ballarat Benevolent Asylum. You won't find much of this side of life in the state records. These tend to turn up in digitized newspapers because they're not to do with state government institutions and government, and government organization. So you need to really look at things like the digitized newspapers to get a sense of life on the gold fields. However, some of the records we have are quite wonderful, and these are the ones I'm hoping to introduce to you today. Um, I'd like to first talk about um, a Ballarat pioneer who came out from China in 1849. His name was Abu Mason. He um, was naturalized in 1857. He married a local woman in Ballarat and he had four children. He was an entrepreneur, a miner, an interpreter, a government employee, and a constant spokesman for the Chinese community. He probably annoyed a lot of people, was never shy of giving an opinion, and he turns up very often in the digitized newspapers. Um, very early on in his career, um, he was employed by the local protector of Chinese. So all the goldfields areas had what was called a Chinese protectorate. The Chinese protector in Ballarat was called Mr. Foster. His job was to arrange interpreters at the courts, prevent intercultural um, incidents, 
to pub make sure that the Chinese population knew what the Victorian government laws and regulations were, and most important, to collect a great deal of money from the community through the discriminatory taxes on Chinese miners. Um, in terms of organisation, they attempted to get the Chinese population to live in designated villages, in nice straight lines, clean up their rubbish, and have a headman to whom everyone would be responsible. In reality, the thing was much more messy. Not everyone chose to live in a Chinese camp. People filtered in and out everywhere. Headmen didn't do what they were told. Taxes weren't always collected. And the protectorate um, correspondence is full of complaints about this. However, they also say that the population was very orderly. So, This is a letter book of the Chinese protector of the Ballarat Goldfields. And it is um, a particular treasure. We don't have many records from the protectorate period. Um, about 1855 to 1860 is when these institutions were in place. The diary and letter book covers five years and it is digitised on our Prov Wiki. Digitised and transcribed for those of you who have trouble reading English. There's a great deal of information in that diary. And there's a little brief glimpse of Abu Mason here, who in 1856 was employed as a headman of the Canadian village. That's a mining area in Ballarat. There were six Chinese villages in Ballarat at this time, a huge Chinese population. Um, there were Chinese operas and circuses going on. There were tea houses. There were um, all sorts of... It was a very lively community. There were kite makers and specialists of all kinds, as well as people very busy digging for gold. Um, the next record I'm showing you is also about Abu Mason, and this is a much later record. This is from um, some records that I'd like to emphasise in this talk. They're mining records um, in the Ballarat um, collection from the Ballarat Mining District. And everyone mined in Ballarat. They mined from the 1850s right through to the 20th century. And they frequently mined under city streets. So you will see applications to mine under the town hall of Ballarat East, solemnly going in to the mining department and solemnly coming back, refused. But nonetheless, people made the attempt. And every time an application was made, a survey had to be made. So there are maps of Ballarat in the mining records that are contemporary and give you an absolute snapshot of what is happening in that month, in that little particular segment. And the surveyor, he hasn't on this, in this case, but the surveyor will put down sludge piles and puddling whims and piggeries and hedges on these surveys for the inner city area. This is, I just put this one up because that's Abu Mason's house there in a little group of Chinese houses on an area that someone not Chinese wishes to mine. And that's, that little notebook is pocket size, fitted into the surveyor's back pocket, and he would write out and do his sketches with pen and ink and didn't seem to ever blot them, which is quite amazing. So um, mining records are a great treasure. I'll talk a little bit more about them. But I'm now going back to the Chinese protectorate. So we're back to Mr. Foster and his letter book. And I'm showing you uh, an official document, a notice to the Chinese population in Chinese. This is a letter from Mr. Foster to central headquarters announcing that he has just paid for and authorised a notice to be translated into Chinese and put in the local paper. Now, um, I call this talk Records of Chinese on the Ballarat Goldfields because I am mentioning some records that aren't in the archives. This is one of them. This is another great treasure of Ballarat. This is um, a notice in the Chinese newspaper in Ballarat. It's a year later than the one in Foster's letter, but nonetheless, it was put in by Mr. Foster. This newspaper is a great treasure. It's... Um, Probably the world's first bilingual English Chinese newspaper it was published in Ballarat. Um, we only have about eight copies of it in Australia, and four of them are in the Ballarat Library, and they have been digitised. So if you wish to read um, a nice series of advertisements encouraging Chinese people to buy candles and keep their camps clean, you can go to the Central Highlands Library website and see these, um, see these newspapers. So there are a few official news um, notices still surviving today. This is um, a fairly early start at sending um, notices and regulations to the Chinese population. Eventually, the Chi uh, Victorian government had to invest in official 
um, central government interpreters and translators and proper printing equipment, and the Victorian government printer throughout the 19th century printed a considerable amount of material in Chinese. So um, this is actually a fragment of a huge poster. It is a um, mining statute, number 480. It was, um, went through Parliament in 1875, and um, it has been translated into Chinese by C.P. Hodges, who is the chief Chinese interpreter of the colony of Victoria. Do note that he's not Chinese. The Victorian government preferred to employ Europeans educated in Chinese rather than Chinese interpreters, feeling that their loyalty was not in question. Um, I don't know about the quality of the Chinese translation either. I think as people start to read these things more, we might get some comments on the competence of these interpreters, however. Now, um, this is a little detective story, just for a bit of fun. I had been reading in the um, Ballarat, Ballarat East Local Board of Health Minutes. Again, sounds boring, in fact, fascinating. If you want to know about epidemics, diseases, unsanitary schools, and, the, and the, the trials of being the public health inspector in Ballarat, these minutes are wonderful. And in the minutes, um, there's a little note saying that the Central Board of Health in Melbourne has sent Ballarat East some nice posters in Chinese, and would they please put them up around the town? We didn't have any left in our correspondence. So just out of interest, I um, contacted my colleagues in the Bendigo Regional Archive Centre and said, could you have a look in your correspondence round about this date? And they did. To my great joy, they found the very poster, including some more correspondence from the Central Board of Health. So that is also digitised on our wiki with a translation from Professor Mai Nai of um, New York. Um, and it's telling people to be very clean because there's been an outbreak of plague in Sydney, essentially. And if they're not very clean, they'll be fined. But you can read the translation for yourself. And you can go to Bendigo and look at the original if you want to. And that's one of the joys of the archives, particularly the Victorian archives. They're right here. You can go and have a look at these records and hold them in your hands. So, having mentioned the Prob Wiki and mentioned our website, I'm going to say that the quickest way into it is simply Google Prov, P-R-O-V, and Wiki, and it will appear. If you want our website, you can simply Google P-R-O-V, and our website will appear. Once you've found our website, there's a considerable degree of help um, on it to help you navigate around and find things on it. Um, later on after this talk, I won't take questions because we're running a little tight on time, but um, I'll be available outside and you can come and ask me any questions you like about finding the wiki or about um, finding these records. So we talked a little bit about government records, about official documents in Chinese, about the fact that the Chinese community was so significant in the 19th century, but a very reluctant Victorian government had to set up um, official interpreters and translators and a whole printing outfit to print material in Chinese. And again, the municipal, local court and mining records of Creswick, of Ballarat East and Ballarat, which are all defined as the central mining district of Ballarat in the 19th century, contained a lot of local records from Chinese people. Um, this really beautiful little bit I extracted because it has a nice red seal on it, as you can see. There are very few seals on the documents. So um, I saved this for an illustration. This is the full document. It is, in fact, uh, an invoice for groceries. So, um, as was common on the gold fields, people didn't pay their bills. So, at a certain date of the year, all the shopkeepers took their debtors to court to get the money back. So a um, Chinese grocery in Creswick, in fact, took one of their debtors to court and they produced the bill as evidence in the court papers. So that's the bill. Much more decorative than the official translation that the translator turned out for the court to read. And you can find out what this particular gold miner in Creswick had been buying. And it gives a really nice glimpse into the daily life of people on the gold fields in the 1860s. Um, notice the Joss paper. Notice the cabbage and pork and other ingredients, all of which could be found in a Chinese grocery today. 
So these local court records will often find odd bits and pieces that will help you build up a picture of daily life. Um, you can find from people who haven't paid their debts what they were wearing, what sort of furnishings they had, what they were eating, and so on. Um, again, uh, that, what I just showed you is on the Pro Wiki and can be found quite easily. It's been digitised. Now, I want to briefly rush through this. I'm talking about petitions. Petitions were huge in the 19th century and they're a big part of the Public Record Office of Victoria's holdings. Everyone sent petitions into the colonial government and the Chinese community was no exception. This is um, actually a petition from Melbourne held in the main archives and I've got a red star above the name of John Alu who signed this. He was another prominent person on the Ballarat Goldfields. He was an interpreter for Mr Foster, among other things, but he was very famous for running a restaurant in Ballarat. And before you feel very excited about Chinese food on the menu of Ballarat Miners, he in fact serves soup and puddings, knowing his customers extremely well. Um, but many other um, people in China operated restaurants um, and tea houses on the diggings serving Chinese customers who presumably didn't want Christmas-style puddings. Like Abu Mason, John Alou arrived in Victoria early, established an English name for himself, married a local girl and had children born in Ballarat. He and his family eventually moved to New Zealand. But I want to show you the petition because if you have Chinese family ancestors, you might consider the petitions a way of perhaps correlating the English name that you know your ancestor by with perhaps their original Chinese family name. There are problems, many problems, with Chinese names on documents in the Victorian archives, but there's also been a considerable amount of research done on them, and places like genealogy centres in the State Library, online help will um, guide you through some of these problems. And I'd also like to point out that the petitions to the Victorian state government have um, been the subject of two extremely interesting articles by Anna Kai, and those are digital articles on our um, online journal Provenance, which again can be found very easily by Googling Anakai Provenance, and it will turn up magically on your computer screen. I am suggesting these articles because there is simply not time to discuss petitions in this talk. And having said that, I'm going on to more petitions. So this petition is by people in Ballarat, and they have, in 1859, got together to protest the incredible amount of excessive tax they are paying. And uh, very politely, they're pointing out that this year, the special tax on Chinese people is expected to produce £50,000. That's a huge sum of money. They then go on to politely point out, in English translation, not much of this is going back to the Chinese community. Most of it seems to be spent on officials, strange that. Um, perhaps the government might like to devote a bit to the Chinese community. Um, perhaps they'd like to get some Chinese language printing equipment, which the government eventually did, and that they should employ Chinese teachers who are fit persons, employed to open evening schools near the various Chinese camps to teach English. Not an unreasonable demand, we would have thought, and something that's become part of our um, social policy nowadays, but which was turned down flatly um, in a little note on the edge of that petition when it was received in the government department. So that's the English translation supplied with that petition. Um, this one isn't digitised, although I hope to get it up on the wiki soon. But you can order it from the public record office and go in and read it. And you'll notice there were many, many Chinese names on that. These were all people resident in Ballarat at that time. Now, apart from the big petitions on big issues of the day, the other thing that we have in our collection and also in the Victorian Archives collection are petitions to local government. I've called them municipal petitions. Um, sending a petition to the council was how you got things done in the 19th century. If you wanted your road made, if you wanted to drain fixed, if you wanted gas lights put up, if you wanted to complain about the fact that uh, miners had opened a hole in your paddock and a cow had fallen in, which is actually in a note to the council in Ballarat, um, you sent a petition to your local council. And we do have a few petitions from the Chinese community on the Black Lead camp at Creswick. Now, 
not a lot of these have survived, but Cruiswick, um, there are a few, so these are quite special. And these have, in fact, been digitised. They're on the Prov Wiki. Um, this is a joint petition from both European shopkeepers and Chinese residents of the Black Lead. The Black Lead Cap was the main Chinese um, community area in Creswick Borough, that's the Creswick town, and towards the end of the 19th century, it fell in a hole and got flooded because it was, in fact, on top of a mining area and very unstable, as the local health inspector pointed out many times. So nothing really survives physically of this very busy community except a lake, a park, and a plaque in Creswick. But we do have petitions from the people who are living there. In this petition, they are asking that the council please fix the offensive ditch across the road and also, could they repair the public footpath? And they've already, as a community, put in 100 pounds to get this footpath started, and could the council start kicking in? The next petition is from the same area, a few years later. This is just from Chinese residents on the Black Lead camp, and they are asking Creswick to pipe out water from the new town dam that's just been established. Um, at this time, if you wanted town water, you had to petition and you had to promise the council you'd pay for it because the council had to get out a loan and if you weren't going to pay your water rates, they wouldn't supply the water. And I'm pleased to tell you that the um, Blacklead camp got its water in record time and one month under the engineer's estimate and everyone on that petition, in fact, promptly paid their water rates. Their names are there on the water rates uh, receipt book in the Creswick Council except for the man I want to talk about. Now, I forgot to circle his name. His name is Henry Kwok Ping. Now, Henry did not pay water rates because he wasn't living in Creswick. He was, in fact, visiting, I, said, I expect, um, because he was, in fact, a doctor, and he obviously had several places. He visited patients, and Creswick must have been one of them. So Henry was actually living in Ballarat. He was um, a doctor in Victoria Street in Ballarat East, and um, we find him in the rate books for quite a few years here. Henry was also a, um, a person who had determined to settle in Australia. He was naturalised by 1873. He married Anna Jane Glenister of Ballarat in 1874. And before he died at quite a young age, he had two young children, both born in Ballarat. Now, Henry um, described himself as a doctor. He was, in fact, a... Uh, what we call now a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, and as the Ballarat doctors of the day called a herbalist. So um, at this time in the goldfields, anyone could practice medicine if you were prepared to face a malpractice suit if your patients died. What you couldn't do was claim to be a registered medical practitioner. Now, a registered medical practitioner had to have undergone a certain number of years training in a recognised medical institution and had to have documents to prove they passed the exams. And the model was Edinburgh University, but they also, in Victoria, registered people from Chile and from Italy and from Germany. So I have, there was a little bit of fracas in Ballarat East, and I found this letter in the minutes of the Victoria Medical Board who were set up to um, produce a registration list of proper doctors. And if you were a proper doctor, you could say so to your patients, and you could also get government uh, um, positions as coroner or health officer and so on. So it was worth a bit to be on the register. So the next thing I'm going to show is a quick extract, which I will read reasonably quickly. A letter received from Mr Richard Bunce, a very busy Ballarat East doctor who was often coroner, reporting the fact that four Chinese practicing as medical men amongst the uneducated European population there, um, and he's obviously asking the board to do something about this competition. And the board points out to Mr Bunce that um, anyone can take up an unregistered medical practitioner if they want to, it's, and um, if they're claiming to be registered, um, take them to court. But in fact, the board's not interested in prosecuting anyone. They're too busy running their register. So much for Dr. Bunce. However, Henry was never one to, um, to take things quietly, and he, in fact, was quite prepared to take on the Ballarat doctors. And the minutes show that as Yi Kwok Ping, he actually applied to be registered himself as a doctor. He turned up with a translator and a lawyer and his Chinese medical um, training documents. 
Firstly, he was turned down, so he came back again. This time he had the opinion of the Victorian um, Solicitor General who advised the board that if they didn't take this seriously, they could be sued in court. So the board sat down and took this seriously. They got a letter from the British consul in Beijing who said, yes, these are genuine medical documents and yes, it's a real place and yes, Henry has done the required years of training. But after a bit of deliberation, they found a loophole. He hadn't had training in anatomy, so they were able to refuse him. Um, Unfortunately, Henry died um, two years after this hearing in 1877. Otherwise, I'm fairly certain we would have heard more of him. When he left, when he died, um, he left his wife and young sons an 11 room weatherboard house in Ballarat East, the furniture, and his horse and buggy, which is no doubt what he used to do his medical rounds with. Now, again, another digitised will, findable on our website. Wills in Victoria and the probate papers that go with them from 1840 up to 1925 are digitised. You can find them on our website and they're a great resource for family history. And you will, in fact, as I've just shown you, find Chinese ancestors leaving property, um, sometimes leaving property to go back to family in China, sometimes leaving property to Australian family or to local business associates and friends. And just one last slide. Guess what? In 2000, Victoria finally registered traditional Chinese medical practitioners. Only about 100 years too late for Henry, but we finally recognised that branch of medicine. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more, depending on time, um, about the mining records, which I think are one of the real treasures of the Bower Archive Centre. Here's a map, again, from that little pocket notebook of a mining surveyor showing Chinese market gardens along the Yarrowee Creek on the Ballarat east side of the creek. This is 1883. And um, in order to get a market garden or to get a house in Ballarat, we didn't have to buy the land. You could go to the mining department and apply for a miner's right, a right to business and residence, and just pay a low yearly fee. Then you could build your house build your garden, plant your orchard, and you had all the rights of ownership provided you renewed that yearly. Many, many people, including many Chinese residents of Ballarat, used this way to build homes and to set up businesses. And this is an application from Ho Wei. Um, he put in his application in 1897. Uh, he describes exactly where the block is that he wants. The references are to the township plan of Ballarat East, and once again, Township and parish plans for the whole of Victoria are digitised and can be found on the, on the PROV website. Very handy for locating relatives in Victoria. You'll notice he signs his name in English, and we know that is his signature. People had to sign in front of the mining warden. If they couldn't write, if they were illiterate, we'll have um, Maria Barrett, for example, she's got a cross on her mining application witnessed by the warden. So we know Ho Wei could write in English. That is his name and his signature. This is his map of where he wants his garden block to be. It's a little bit wonky, but he probably scribbled it on the back of the application form to show the warden what he was talking about. And this is the area, again, not at the period that Ho Wei made the application. This is um, a different date, but this is again from the field notebooks. And the allotment 7, 117 that you see on the... Right-hand side is mentioned in um, Ho Wei's application, so I'm pretty so sure his allotment would be just about where that top one is, just about. And in fact, he mentions the woolen mills, and here's a segment of the Ballarat East Township plan, and here are the woolen mills circled, and he would have been somewhere near the bottom of that circle to the right um, in his actual plot. So if you can find people, um, I'm not just talking about Chinese ancestors here, but if you can find any people in these mining records, they give you a good deal of information about their living conditions and their businesses at the time that these records were made. And I took a photograph of that same spot. Um, you can see there's no trace of those gardens. Now there would have been ponds and all sorts of irrigation arrangements and outbuildings and huts. They're all gone. They've been just landscaped over now. However, the woolen mills have been preserved. So that's the woolen mills that uh, we were looking at in the map. 
And I think part of the reason I wanted to show you those photos was that in Ballarat, as in many places, a great deal of um, what was there in the 19th century, particularly when we're talking about miners' cottages, mining, gardens and such, have gone. They've been modernised, they've been bulldozed, they've been lost. But using the records in the archives can help you find those old landscapes that have since gone. I'm showing you another business and residence and business application here, simply to show you that um, if you couldn't write in English, then you would write your name, sign your name in Chinese. It's a slightly complicated application because um, uh, this is Argoon writing on behalf of Minki. Minki is actually the applicant for the land, and Argoon has brought the application down and is signing for him. And this is an application from 1897. Now, the mining records in Ballarat, wonderful as they are, are mostly useful from the late 1860s through to the beginning of Federation, simply because that's what survived. Um, so for earlier periods, we don't have quite these sorts of rich surveys to look at. And the other point about these things, like um, inquests and these applications and wills, is that the signature is always that of the person. For petitions, quite often, particularly petitions from our large Chinese community, the names will be written down by one person, possibly because they've got the best handwriting. Um, but when you come to a witness statement, the requirement is the person actually write their name. So this will be the writing of the person at the time. Uh, another sort of mining record, again, um, 1870, this is Ah Xing applying to mine in a reasonably populated area of Ballarat. Um, I didn't follow through to see if he was approved, but the references on that mining survey, again, can take you to the township plan of Ballarat East, and that is his block circled. And there was, in fact, a house on that, so um, in, in uh, these circumstances, miners would come to terms with the inhabitant, and depending on their degree of sophistication, they might simply promise not to knock the fence down while they tunneled under, but some savvy people would demand a percentage of the profits. These would be organised privately. Uh, my last person I want to talk about is um, Samuel John Tongwei. Now, he is slightly later than the people I've been mentioning. He was um, a teacher in Ballarat, and he was born in Ballarat, from his teacher records, wonderful records from the Education Department of Victoria, which are held in the Victorian Archives Centre, but microfilm of them is in Ballarat, as well as in the Victorian Archives. And um, they just record everything of a teacher's teaching life, including some fairly terse comments on their teaching ability if they weren't measuring up. And from Samuel's teacher record, we find that he was born in on the 25th of August in 1894, he was born in Ballarat. His parents were both Chinese from China. They were Christian missionaries to the Ballarat goldfields. His father was a Presbyterian minister, uh, the Reverend Young, uh, Reverend Tungwei, I'm sorry, who lived in Young Street, Ballarat for many, many, many years and was a well-known local identity. A strong tradition of public service that he obviously brought his children up in. Um, Samuel went to Ballarat High School, which was quite an achievement in those days. High school wasn't automatic. And then he began a career with the education department as a junior teacher in 1912. And he did extremely well. He was accepted to the new teachers college in 1914. Again, um, quite an achievement. This is the equivalent to getting into university now and maybe more for the early 20th century. Um, of his teaching, he was reported as being precise and vigorous and leaving a favourable impression. And I've read quite a few of these, and when the inspectors were feeling that someone was wishy-washy, they said so. So um, from his teacher record, we discover that Samuel was appointed to a school in Dalesford on his graduation. And it says here that he enlisted. So I went to the um, National Archives site, the Mapping Out Anzacs, with all the digitised... Uh, records of World War I service people. And I had a look at Samuel's form, which I've um, actually edited. So uh, when he enlisted in 1917 in Dalesford, there was a question on his form. It said, 
have you ever been rejected as unfit for service? And he replied, yes, non-European origin. Well, that's interesting, because many, many people in Ballarat of Chinese descent enlisted. It didn't seem to be a problem, but it turns out that although it was a problem early in the war, once large numbers of people started to die, they were less picky. So um, in the Ballarat correspondence, now I've mentioned municipal correspondence as a marvellous resource for family historians, uh, for ancestors from all over the world. We've got a file in 1915 to do with recruitment because local councils had a great deal to do with recruiting and enlisting people during the First World War. Here's a letter I found about, in the file about the expeditionary forces in 1915. And the um, 18th Brigade is querying the Ballarat Council, saying, 37 Australian-born men of Chinese extraction have been recruited from the Ballarat district. And it goes on to say that they don't really approve of this. Only British subjects substantially of European origin or descent will be accepted for service with the AIF. Could you please comment? There's a hurried penciled note underneath saying, no, we're not doing anything like this, and there's only one person, and that was Mr. Kiang. So I went back to have a look at mapping our Anzacs to see who was enlisting at Ballarat. And in fact, a substantial number of Chinese um, descended Ballarat people did enlist. So it's possible that the council wasn't fussing, just the army. Uh, they also put a note that um, only um, Herbert Kiang has been enlisted here, H. Kiang. So I had a look at that uh, record. He's actually from the K-I-H-A-N-G family, Ki Hang. Um, his father was Chinese, his mother was from Warrnambool. There were four sons born in Ballarat. Um, all three enlisted and only one survived the war. So um, I think that's about all I can really fit in now, but I'll just show one last photo. This photo is in the, in the Victorian Archive Centre. It's a picture of the Ballarat Joss House in Main Road. It is the very last Joss House to exist in Ballarat, and it was pulled down in the 1960s, derelict. Now, there were more, so many Joss Houses, at least one for each Chinese camp in Ballarat. The Star, digitised Star newspaper, has constant reports of Joss Houses being built, being initiated, ceremonies being held on them, Joss Houses burning down, Joss Houses being moved down the street to a new place. So we know there were lots and lots and lots of these, only one survived to the 1950s, and that's now been lost. So a significant part of what would have been lo the local landscape has gone, and you'll only find these memories in the archives. So I highly recommend our archives as a source of family history, of community memory, and of recovering lost landscapes and buildings. <laughs>